Yeah. Yes. Is this better, Susan? Hmm? Is this better? No, it's too much. It's too much. Go down. Ah, this is fine. This is fine. Yeah, that's good. Better. Yes, much better. Okay. Niharika, shall we start? Shall I start? Yeah, yeah. I'll just start. Okay. Uh, uh, good day to all. Thank you so much for joining us for today's lecture from Bardic Epic to Court Poetry, theme and, Themes and Variations by Professor Keshan Veluthar, who retired as Professor of History from the University of Delhi and has taught at the Ecole des Hautitudes Paris, Mahatma Gandhi University, Koteam, and at JNU. He is the author of some 18 books in English and Malayalam, including The Political Structure of Early Medieval South India, The Early Medieval in South India, and most recently, The Buffalo Century, Vancheshwara Dikshita's Mahisha Shatakam, a political satire for all centuries. We're very privileged to have as chair Professor David Shulman, Rene Lang Professor of Humanistic Studies at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and one of our foremost authorities of South India's literatures, arts, and religious history. Today's is the 10th lecture in a series initiated by the International Research Division at the India International Center, Delhi, Kriti Samhita, the plurality of Indian knowledge systems. It forms part of a project, Samhita, South Asian Manuscript Histories and Textual Archive, which IIC started in 2022 with the support of the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Samhita's goal is to create a database and a digital repository on manuscripts of South Asian provenances housed in libraries and private collections all over the world. This will be an online platform that scholars all over the world would have access to. Now may I request Professor Shulman to take over the proceedings and introduce the theme of today's lecture and our speaker. Thank uh, you, Neha. Sorry, just one moment. So, um, this, uh, we, will, we are requested to type your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we'll take them at the end. We'll have half an hour at the end for questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's a, a great pleasure to be a guest of the India International Center and of Samhita. And it's a particular delight to be here together with Keshav and Belutat, um, who, as uh, Niharika has just told us, is a great authority on the history of pre-modern South India. Actually, it would be more correct to say that he is the preeminent authority on pre-modern uh, South India, um, not only in Kerala, but throughout the South but perhaps with a special affinity and love for Kerala and Malayalam and the uh, Kerala culture and literature. Um, I, uh, I could say a lot more about his historical work, but I don't want to take time from the lecture. Um, let me just say that along with being a truly magnificent historian, Keshavan Velutad is also a very fine Sanskritist. Um, if you want in the Q&A at the end of this session, if you'd like to know, uh, he taught me how he was instructed in learning Sanskrit by, I believe, an uncle. And um, it's a foolproof method, I can tell you that. I'll leave it uh, for Keshavan himself to tell you. Uh, in the last few years, Keshavan has given us two translations into Malayalam of two of the great Mahakavyas in Sanskrit, Bharavi's Kirata Udruniya and Magha's Shishu Palavadha. This is no mean feat. Those of you who know Mahakavya know that the verses, both of Bhāravi and also of uh, Magha, they, they're beautiful, um, and they're beautifully crafted, and they're also often sometimes very challenging to read and to understand. So to have a Malayalam translation of both of these works, both of them very long, that's a tremendous achievement. And he'll be talking to us today about these two works with, I believe, a special emphasis on the Kirata Junior. Please, Keshavan. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shulman, for those uh, very, very nice words. Respected uh, Chair and uh, other friends and colleagues. I'm extremely grateful to the India International Center, New Delhi 
for inviting me to give a talk at its International Research Division. We thank particularly Dr. Sudhar Goparakishan, its director, for this courtesy. As the International Research Division of the IIC has the literary treasures and knowledge systems of India among its concerns, I shall take up one of the more important Mahakavyas, grand poems in Sanskrit for discussion this evening. Poets of all times have had episodes from the epic literature as their staple. In India, the Mahabharata and Ramayana have proved to be inexhaustible repertoire for poets of all descriptions. In taking up themes and episodes from epic poetry and developing them into poems of varying elaborations, poets of later times also chose to bring in variations in the themes of the episodes. A close examination of the original and the variant forms of these help historians to use them as lenses to see the contexts, social and political, which, in which they were produced and provide keys to answering the questions about not only the changing requirements, but also the changing sensibilities of the times. There are scores of examples where poets have taken episodes from the epics and developed them into poems, some great and some not so great. The ways in which Bhansa developed themes of the Indian epics into beautiful plays, Kalidasa transformed the Chakantala Pachyana into the all time classic. Bharavi crafted his grand poem from a theme from the Mahabharata. Magha composed his poem with bells on, with another episode taken from the Yuti. And Sri Harsha wrote his Naishathiya Charita with yet another Mahabharata theme, are all such cases. And the list can be extended endlessly. In the present essay, I presume to take up the treatment of an epic theme in a Mahakavya, namely Bharavi's Kirat Arjuniya. The story of Arjuna performing penance to get divine weapons from Indra and Shiva is told in the Aranyaka Parvan of Mahabharata. The Pandavas had lost the game of dice and were required to spend 12 years in the forest and one year in Cognito. They were living in the Dvaita forest. One day, the sage Markandeya called on them and impressed upon Yudhishthira that it is unethical if one acts constantly under the feeling that one had no power. The brothers and their wife were sitting in the evening talking about various things. They were mired in grief and sorrow. Panjali talked to Yudhishthira about her grief, its causes, the wickedness which caused even those in the Kaurava camp, except Shakuni, Karna, Duryodhana, and Dushasana cry, and so on. She reminded him of the lack of comparison between the royal splendor and pomp in which they were earlier living and the misery which they were currently going through. She asked him if his heart felt on no qualms looking at his brothers and at her. She argued in favor of exercising power, for the Kauravas did not deserve patience. She tried to drive home her point by referring to a conversation between Prahlada and Mahabadi, where Prahlada assures Mahabadi that in choosing between patience and the use of force, it is not wrong to use force where that is necessary. Yudhishthira, however, was not moved. He gave a lengthy lecture on the evils of anger and the advantages of patience. What Panchali advocated was tantamount to heresy, mastikya. His own actions, karma, were not with a view to their results. Panchali would not leave things there. She accepted the importance of dharma but insisted that mere lip service to dharma will not lead them anywhere. 
strength was at the base of everything. She was only sorry for the weak. Yudhishthira reiterated the importance of dharma and said that he would not waver from dharma. Panchali should give up her heretical thoughts. Panchali pleaded that she did not revile or condemn the law in any way. She was just babbling from grief. It is not proper to sit quiet without taking the course to manliness. Yudhishthira did not answer. Thereupon, an angry Bhima argued that the Kaurava should be punished immediately. It is not becoming of the brave to invite trouble in the name of Dharma. Yudhishthira would not be moved, however much he was guarded. He would not stray away from Dharma under any circumstance. Bhima reminded him that living incognito for one year was impossible for the likes of them, for the agents of Duryodhana would spot them somehow or other. They would have to live in the forest forever. Yudhishthira tried to console Bhima. It is sinful to act recklessly. It will lead to sorrow. The Kauravas were powerful and they were no match to them. He said that his nights were sleepless because of these worries. Bhima Sena, indignant though he was, understood the truth and became upset and alarmed. He had no answer. At this point, Vyasa arrived there. He told Yudhishthira that he knew what, was the, what he was thinking. He assured him that he was there to allay his fear of Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, Karna and Ashutthana. He told him, he took him aside and taught him a spell called Pratistuti with the advice that Arjuna should practice it to propitiate Indra, Shiva and the gods guarding the directions and acquire divine weapons. Everybody was relieved upon hearing this and all moved to the Kamika forest. One day, Yudhishthira told Arjuna privately that Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, Karna and Ashwatthaman were all well worth in all aspects of warfare, that the Kauravas had won them over to their side and he was their last resort and that on him rested their burden. He must take them all to victory. He taught him the secret spell and asked him to practice yoga and do penance to propitiate Indra to acquire divine weapons. Arjuna lost no time. He armed himself and set out, taking leave of, leave of Panchali, his brothers and the priests. He met no obstacles on the way. Crossing many hills, he reached the Himalayas in a day's time. Then he crossed the Himalayas, the, the Gandhavadana mountain and many impenetrable forests and hills and reached Indrakila in a few days. Suddenly he heard a voice. Halt. It was of a sage sitting in the shade of a tree, thin and wearing a matted hairlock, resplendent with a divine glow. He said to Arjuna that he was in the place of Hermes, who had given up joy and anger, where weapons had no place. He was asked to lay his bow. He had already reached the end of his journey. However, the sage was not successful in changing Arjuna's mind. He did not discard his bow. But the sage was pleased. He told Arjuna with a smile that he was Indra himself and that Arjuna could ask for any boon. Arjuna prostrated before him and asked for the divine weapons as boon. Indra repeated that Arjuna had already reached the ultimate station and that he did not need weapons anymore. Arjuna explained that he desired no personal gains. If he left his brothers in the wilderness without avenging the few, his infamy would reach all the worlds and stay forever. Indra told him that he would get all divine weapons if he propitiated Shiva. Indra disappeared. Arjuna began his penance. 
wearing only the skin of an antelope and some verbha grass, he devoted himself to awesome austerities. He ate only some fruits, once in three days in the first month and once in six days in the second month. In the third month, he would eat only dry leaves falling from the trees, that too, once in a fortnight. From the fourth month onwards, he subsisted on wind and stayed on the tip of his big toe, arms raised. His braided hair took on the sheen of a thick cloud bearing lightning because of a ceaseless wind. Scared, the sages living around went up to Shiva and told him about the impossible self-mortification casting smoke on the skies. They did not know what he wished to achieve, but he anguished all of them. They requested him to stop Arjuna. Shiva consoled them and told them that they could go back without any fear, for he was aware of Arjuna's intentions. He had no desire for heaven. His aim was not longevity or prosperity. Shiva would fulfill his desire straight away. Contented, the sages went back. When the sages were all gone, Shiva, the wielder of the Pinaka bow, disguised himself as a hunter, his body glowing like another Mount Meru, accompanied by Parvati, who was dressed in like manner. He rushed towards Arjuna. His Bhuta retainers accompanied him, again in various guises. Then a demon called Moka approached Arjuna in the guise of a bow. Arjuna took his bow and arrow. Shiva, in the guise of a hunter, stopped Arjuna and told him that it was his prey. Being no heed, Arjuna shot an arrow. The hunter too shot one. Both struck the body of the bow simultaneously. The demon took his own form and dropped it head. The inevitable quarrel between Arjuna and the hunter followed, which ended up in a fight. Both fought with arrows, but eventually Arjuna's supposedly inexhaustible quiver became empty. Arjuna started beating the hunter with his bow, and the hunter swallowed it. He charged the hunter with his sword, sharp and unstoppable, but even that was shattered to pieces. He threw rocks and trees on the hunter, but the hunter took all of them lightly. Then he hit him with his fist. The hunter returned to the blows, and Arjuna fell unconscious. At this point, Shiva revealed his identity and told Arjuna that he was pleased with his bravery and dedication to the cause. Arjuna begged forgiveness for his excesses. Shiva returned Arjuna's weapons and asked him to take any boon. Arjuna prayed for the Pashivata bow. Shiva promptly gave it, warning him how murderous it was and how destructive it could be when used injudiciously. After that, Indra and all other gods of the directions blessed him with weapons. It is this episode in the Mahabharata that Bharavi developed into a grand poem in 18 chapters, a little more than a thousand verses of exquisite beauty and craft. The poem opens with a spy, a forester disguised as a Brahmana student, reporting to Yudhishthira about the impeccable way in which Duryodhana, who had gained the country by foul play, was ruling it with a view to winning over the people. The details of Duryodhana's governance are exactly as prescribed in the textbooks of statecraft in early medieval India. The spy, however, informed Yudhishthira that in spite of it all, Duryodhana was living in constant fear of the Pandavas' return. So he concluded the Pandavas had to think of their future codes. To his children are related to this brother, this to his brothers in the presence of Anchali. She said that 
it was time that yudhishthira had her complaint to us about the terrible humiliation they had to suffer at the hands of the gurus their present predicament and the inefficiency of yudhishthira yudhishthira did not reply bhima endorsed what panchali said using arguments from the textbooks of strict rap would the rodhana who had enjoyed the benefits of the kingdom for so long return it on a platter after the pandavas had fulfilled the conditions in the stipulated time even if he would what was the use of the mighty arms of the pandava brothers they must act immediately with his serious replies to were based on the shastra text it was not prudent to act on instinct indiscretion is the base of misfortune success is on the side of those who act with discretion by the time so that the rodhana would have made enough enemies who would be ready to join them as bhima was thus being consoled vyasa the sage arrived there he explained to yudhishthira that the kauravas were still very powerful that bhishma drona and karna were more than a match to the pandavas and they should start their preparations straight away he would teach arjuna a spell with which he should propitiate indra and gain divine weapons yudhishthira noted and arjuna received the spell and discipline of yoga from the sages and set out taking leave of his brothers panchali and the priests vyasa had arranged a yaksha to show him the way the next two chapters that is 4 and 5 are very elaborate and highly poetic descriptions of the beautiful group as well as the mountain the skill of the poet in language meter and alankaras and so on particularly in chapter 5 is inimitable arjuna began his penance it was so severe that the residents of the forest felt miserable on account of its terrible effects they went to indra and told him that a strange youth clad in the habit of a hermit but wearing arms was doing such severe penance in the mountain that it was impossible for them to do indra must do something indra knew what was going on and was happy about his son but he did not disclose his pleasure and did not protest his son sent heavenly news to seduce him the next three chapters 7 8 9 9 beautiful descriptions of the aerial journey to indra in the camp of their aerial journey to indra kila in the company of celestial musicians their love sports in the forest and in the river and their actual love making freshened up the news tried to seduce him but in way that is described in chapter 10 indra was doubly happy disguised as a decrepit city he went to arjuna and lectured to him on the importance of non violence patience and so on arjuna disagreed respectfully telling him on the need he was in for the wild weapons indra revealed his identity hugged him and told him that he must propitiate shiva the wielder of the vinaka bow before he could get divine weapons from himself and the other gods guarding the directions arjuna began his presence the sign even more rigorous it became impossible for the hermits to live in the area they and they went up to shiva to complain about this strange man shiva told them that he was an ordinary person he was none other than nara a friend of vishnu shiva also knew why he was doing penance nara and narayana were both on the earth to protect the people the demons were not happy and had sent muka who conscious that he cannot take on arjuna directly was going to kill arjuna sneakily in the guise of a bow shiva 
disguised as a hunter would go there. Both would show arrows at the bow, and the usual quarrel between hunters would follow. The hermits could see for himself, themselves how brave Arjuna was. Accordingly, Shiva disguised himself as a hunter, his retinue likewise disguised, and proceeded, pretending to be hunting, to the bow sitting in front of Arjuna. Both shot an arrow each at the bow and it promptly dropped dead. Arjuna went up to the bow to retrieve the arrow. Not so much he was short of arrows, but because he wanted to keep it as a trophy. There he saw a retainer of the hunter. He made a pretense of saluting Arjuna and said, You put even the sun to sheep by your luster, but you should not take this arrow with which my master killed the bow. You are wise enough not to covet the arrow of others, and you should be ashamed of killing a, a game and an animal shot by another person. An arrow is nothing for my master, who owns many horses, whole forest full of elephants, and huge treasures of gems, but he will not tolerate transgression. By giving up your claim on this arrow, uh, may there be an unpremeditated friendship between the two of you, one like that of Rama and Sugriva. If you are in need of an arrow, why don't you ask the chief? If a friend like you asked, what would he not give? It is perilous to covet the property of the mighty. This king is very well versed in the science of archery. Don't dismiss him as a forester. He holds a resplendent bow, comparable to the standard of Indra, with its string thick as the chief of serpents. Submitting to his interests, you can achieve what you desire. Cultivating friendship of the mighty is beneficial and will preempt trouble." Unquote. Arjuna refuted all his arguments. The hunter was no match to him. Friendship between them was out of the question. Such evil people were natural enemies of the righteous. As for begging an arrow, those who are used to taking things by force would never do it. The hunter would be advised not to land himself in trouble. The page left, threatening Arjuna, and went back to the hunter's chief. The hunter's army charged on Arjuna, creating the noise of waves of the ocean risen by the storm of the final deluge. But the swift arrows of the hermit shattered the army and they ran away. Skanda chastised them. How could trusted bodyguards betray their master like that? Shiva consoled the soldiers with a gentle laugh and they returned to the field. Now it was direct fight between Arjuna and the hunter. Arjuna felt that, despite there being no fourfold army and an appropriate battle, his power was draining off. Was it some kind of an illusion? Had he become another person, his arrows were not as effective as before. It was clear that he was fighting with no ordinary hunter. He was indeed a greater archer than Bhishma and Drona. A determined Arjuna shot different kinds of arrows, such as the one which would put the enemy to sleep, one which would bring in serpents, one which would set the whole arena ablaze, but all in vain. When the magical weapons failed, Arjuna decided to fight with his own weapons. The army of Bhutas was shattered and he took on the hunter hierarchy. Arjuna's cure suddenly became empty. He lost his bow and the sword too, and the sword too disappeared. Arjuna engaged the hunter in a duel using his fists. The hunter jumped up. Arjuna wanted to smash him on the ground by taking hold of his legs, but pleased by Arjuna touching his feet, 
Shiva revealed himself and blessed Arjuna with a weapon. He asked for the other gods to bless Arjuna and gifted him many divine weapons. Thus, we see many variations in the theme taken from the epics and developed into a grand poem. We should look at these variations less from the point of view of aesthetics and literary criticism than from the point of history where I claim to be more at home. It will be too simplistic to explain these only in terms of better poetic abilities of the court poet and more meaningful to locate the epic and the portly text within the context in which they were produced and seek to explain the why of these variations. In looking at these variations from the point of view of history, it is important to bear in mind that the Mahabharata in which, both the, in which this episode occurs is an epic. This may sound like a truism, but the fact that it participates in all features of oral poetry is too important to be ignored. They consisted of hero notes and such like, generously employing stock phrases and formulaic expressions composed and transmitted by word of mouth from generation to generation. They were recited as some kind of performance where people gathered, such as in sacrificial halls. It's important to remember that both the epics from India, namely Mahabharata and Ramayana were recited first in the sacrificial halls of Janamejaya and Rama, respectively. It is now accepted on almost all hands that the Mahabharata comprises two major layers, namely a narrative layer and a didactic layer. Didactic portions such as what are contained in the Anishasana Parvan and the Shanti Parvan have been shown as relating to a much later date than the narrative ones, such as the Sadha Parvan and the Aranyaka Parvan. This does not mean that the two are watertight compartments. However, it can be safely said that the social formation that the narrative portions represent is close to what has been described as lineage-based. Power and control exercised to the being that of a chief and level. Anthropological studies have laid bare features of such societies, and these insights help in understanding the Mahabharata with greater clarity. The didactic sections, on the other hand, represent a society characterized by social differentiation based on unequal distribution of wealth and with an authentic state to protect it. As for the Kiratar Dinidia, which is the product of a well-settled society with an authentic state, Bharim, its author, lived in the 5th century CE, that is, when India had entered the early medieval phase of her history. Researchers in the past two or three decades have provided considerable clarity in relation to this period. Among its features are a clearly stratified agrarian society and a relatively well-organized state system. The state is monarchical, presided over by a king, who aspires to expand his power see, and seeking to be the overlord of his neighbors, a Vijigishu. <clears throat> Governance, at least in theory, was based on textbooks of statecraft known as Dandaditi, which had been recognized as an authentic branch of knowledge, the fourth one after Anvikshiki, Trayi, and Varta. The poem will make better sense when looked at from this point. Take, for instance, its opening words. Shriya kutu unama dhipasya varadani prajasu vrittim yama yunta veditam savarni lingi vidita samayayav yudhishthidam 
ด้วยสวัสดีสวัสดีใช่ไหมครับ Can be translated somewhat like this: The forester who had been sent to find out the way in which the king of the Kurus was guarding his sovereignty and conducting himself among his subjects gathered intelligence in the guise of a Brahmana student and came to Yudhishthira in the Dwaita forest. Now, what are the what are the points here? Number one, Yudhishthira gets intelligence through a spy, a forester in the guise of a brahmacharya. The state that Kautilya of Satyasastra arises worked with a well-lit network of espionage. In fact, the king is famously described as Charatakshus, the one who has spies for his eyes, an expression which Bharavi himself uses. Kaudilya recommends employing a forester to learn Vanachara as a spy, for he can know about Kukli and Incognito Vadi Vanachara Karya. She grants Charaparamvara. A student can do the job as well. Paramarmanya Pragarbha Shatra Kapatika. Again, Chitrabhanu. In his commentary on Kiratardiniya, which is arguably the best, draws our attention to the word praja used to describe subjects. Its primary meaning is children. The idea that the king should look after the people of his kingdom like his children occurs for the first time in the edicts of Ashoka. Ashoka said, I quote, All men are my children. As on behalf of my children, I desire that, that they may be provided with complete welfare and happiness in this world and in the other world. Even so, is my desire on behalf of all men. Unquote. It is the same sentiment that Kautilya expresses. I quote, the king's happiness is in the happiness of his subjects. What is beneficial to his subjects is beneficial to him. Prajasukhe sukham rajnyam prajanam cha hite hitam. The first articulation of this idea in the Kavya literature seems to be in the Reghumsha, where Dilipa is described as, I quote, the father of his subjects because he disciplined them, protected them, and provided for them. Their fathers were just the cause of their births. Prajanam, Vinayadhana, Yakshana, Bharanadapi, Sapita, Pitara, Tasam, Kevalam, Dhyanmahetava. This opening verse of Pirata Arjuna is just the beginning. The report of the spy on the reign of Duryodhana is as if it is taken straight from some textbook of statecraft. Duryodhana, according to him, has subdued the six passions that are enemies of self-mastery. This is Kautilya's advice. Discipline can, I quote, discipline can be achieved by overcoming passions such as Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Moha, Maga, and Arsha. He follows the path of Manu, that is, Duryodhana follows the path of Manu, and he divides his uh, days and nights appropriately. It is by following the science of Niti that Duryodhana prevents subversion of Dharma. Among his many projects of welfare is irrigation, which enables crops not to depend on rain. The expression used here is Adeva Matrika, taken directly from Kutila. The second half of the first chapter is Panchadi's plea for immediate action. The epic devotes four full chapters to this and two to Yudhishthira's reply to it, while Bharavi uses just 14 or 15 verses. The kind of conflict between ethics, that is dharma, and action, that is karma, or the importance of power that Panchadi of the epic is concerned with, this is not a problem that worries the Panchari of the Kavya. 
Hence, it's a very personal argument against the humiliation. While Yudhishthira's reply to Panchali in the epic is based on dharma and honesty, he does not answer her at all in the Kavya. A comparison of Bhima's argument in support of Panchali and Yudhishthira's reply to it in the epic and in the Kavya is instructive. Bharam is Bhima. She is in so many words that Yudhishthira's discerning intellect was well versed in all the four branches of knowledge. A clear reference to Kaudilya's understanding of the four branches of knowledge. In the epic, the basis of the argument of both is Satya, Dharma, and Anrishamsya. Why? In the Kavya, it is based exclusively on strategy and other exigencies of statecraft. The difference in emphasis, this difference in emphasis is important in the ways in which the same idea is expressed by the bard and the poet. I'll take just one example. Take the famous aphorism in Kiratarjuna, which is uh, quoted outside, out of context also. Sahasa vidadhi talankriyam abhimeka paramapadam padam one should not act in haste. Lack of discrimination is the prime source of misfortune. Prosperity, which loves virtues, chooses the one who thinks before acting. The idea here is indebted to the following words in Mahabharata. Mahabhava nikarmani I'll translate it as those sinful acts which are done in mere haste will cause sorrow. While the epic argues that things done in a haste will cause sorrow and hence should be avoided, the poem advocates avoiding hasteful action as a matter of policy. And the second half of the words underlines this. Again, when Bharavi puts into the mouth of Yudhishthira the principle that a king who acts gently or harshly according to the occasion will stay with brilliance like the sun, what he has in mind is the prescription of Kautilya, that is, Tikshna Dandoki, Bhotana Uttajani Yobhoti. That is, harsh punishment will be too much, soft punishment will fail, deserving punishment will be respected. Again, with Hishtira's argument that Yadavas who are their natural allies would not leave them and go to the Rodha and so on clearly shows the influence of the following classification of allies in the Arthasastra. There are three kinds of allies and friends. The ones by nature, on account of location, that is, the ones by kinship, and the ones that are contingent, that is, cultivated by the one of the In fact, allies are one of the important names of the state in the Kautilian scheme. Arjuna's self-reflection in the beginning of chapter 16 is interesting in many ways. He is surprised that his weapons were failing before a haphazard, undisciplined set of hunters. There were no rotting elephants trained in the art of warfare, no chariots that covered the earth, no dust raised by the wheels of the speeding chariots, no foot soldiers charging at one another, no heavenly leaves waiting for the fallen heroes, no drowning of the din of the war drums by the squealing of the chariot wheels, the neighing of the horses, and the trumpeting of the, of the elephants. And even his own strength, which had once vanquished the power of the great and invincible warrior heroes, was overpowered 
in this battle with lowly bands, like sunshine being dimmed in moonlight. It hardly needs an elaboration that Bhadavi considered an army without the classical elements and qualities as just lowly bands. Even the descriptions of war that follows are informed by principles elaborated in the textbook. There is one more thing which I want to mention before I end this discussion of the historical aspects of uh, the context of Kiravarjani. Many inscriptions of Gangas who ruled in Karnataka describe King Durvinita who ruled towards the end of the 5th century as one who had commented on the 15th chapter of Kiravarjani. Such claims, making the patron accomplished in the arts and sciences, are frequent in inscription or rhetoric in early medieval India, most of which is usually heard of. Here there is a difference though. The claim is that the king had commented on a specific kavya and just one chapter in it. The 15th chapter is the toughest in Kiratarjaniya, what with the complicated Chitrabandhas, palindromes, and so on. Understanding this chapter may give us a clue to what the poet was trying to achieve, more than just show off in language, meter, and so forth. There is some deep, expressive drive at work going beyond the rules or norms for Kavli other preparations such as Dandin and Bhamaha have prescribed, who in any case postdate Bharavi. In fact, the chapter is by itself a great masterpiece. As the grand poem moves to a climax, it is as if language were suddenly expanding or perhaps breaking apart and then reuniting. In a way, a linguistic equivalent of the great fight between Shiva and Arjuna in which both players seem to come together into an organic unit. It takes an accomplished scholar to negotiate with it. Perhaps Durvinita had the equipment to do it. At least the authors of the Prasisti recognized the potential of such equipment. The content of that chapter too is equally appealing to a ruler in the context of early medieval India unable to bear the severe fight put up by Arjuna. The Bhutas of Shiva dropped their weapons and ran away. Skanda, the chief of the army, stopped them and chided them for their cowardice. How can trusted Bhutri guards leave their master like that? Shiva soothed them with a cool laughter which persuaded them to return to the field and the fight. This episode acquires importance within the context of the poetry of early medieval South India. Early medieval literary texts and inscriptions from South India speak about a group of trusted bodyguards of the kings. They are known variously as the realm or the hunted groups in the inscriptions of the Chairas, Tenevan Avatodavigal in the Pandan records. Tirumai Kappa or Udan Indra Padaivira in the Chora inscriptions, Velevali, Lanka, Geruda, and so on in the records of the Gungas, Chalukas, and Hoysalas. They were bound by oath to stay by the king in whatever situation. The king on his side had such love and trust in them. No wonder the 15th chapter of Kiratarjaniya attracted Durvinita. This discussion of the variations introduced while reworking the epic episode into the grand poem of Kiratarjaniya shows that the epic and the court poems were products of two different ages, two different social formations, two different worlds. The difference occurring between a corpus of oral poetry and a text of Literary literature was hard to miss. 
the differences between a pre or non literate society and a literate society, between a pre state or non state society and a state society, between ethicality and strategy. A few questions may be relevant here, particularly in the light of these variations. The elaborate description of Arjuna's journey to the Himalayas and Indrakila in the company of the Yaksha in two full chapters, four and five, is the first major variation that we see. Um, he finishes it in one day in Mahabharata. The description of the slow progress achieved with great mastery of language, meter, and alangaras in the Kavya is in sharp contrast with the prosaic description of Arjuna's reaching the Himalayas in just one day in the epic. In the Kavya, Arjuna does not come across Indra on his way. The descent of the Apsaras down to the Himalayas and the counterpart of Arjuna's ascent up the mountain. Together, they complement each other. The epic does not have this at all. There are scholars who believe that a detailed description of the love sports of the Apsaras and the Gandharvas in the woods, in the river, and their camps, described so elaborately and so beautifully in four full chapters, is redundant as they do not contribute much to the progress of the narrative, but they forget that the function of such core poetry is not to narrate the story. These chapters contribute immensely to support the heroic sentiment we need, which is central to the poem with the help of the ancillary sentiment of love. There is no place for the latter sentiment in the structure of the narrative in the epic. Again, the description of the war is strikingly different. Arjuna is all alone and the hunter chief is well equipped with a huge army of soldiers. It all begins with a debate between Shiva's messenger and Arjuna, where Arjuna underlines the importance of social stratification and how much there was no comparison between him and the hunter chief. The war itself, as mentioned earlier, was on a different level. The dramatic end of the war and the way in which the aeroplanes of the gods jostled in the sky to watch it are presented inevitably. The variations in theme and differences in the way of treatment also raise important questions about the audiences of the two genres as well as their reception and impact. The epic had its audience in the gatherings in the assembly halls of the sacrifices. The oral performance had the primary function of telling stories in the intervals in the leisure time during the course of satra sacrifices. The function of such narratives, often telling the stories about the exploits of the Yajamana sacrificer or his ancestors, included seeking prestige and legitimacy to the sacrificer and his lineage. That was important in a lineage-based society, organized at the chiefdom level. The audience consisted largely of the participants in the sacrifices, learned in their own way, but being ritual specialists, their learning was in fields other than literary appreciation. The epics are less of ornate poetry than the Kavyas. On the other hand, the Kavyas had cultivated scholarly gentlemen for their audience, some kind of Nagarakas that Patsyayana envisages. Did they read these poems on their own in order to have a private experience of the texts? Or did they hear the poems I doubt to them by some reader or performer? There is no way to know for sure. But the general classification of Kavyas into Drishya and Shravya varieties perhaps suggests that the case was probably the latter. The Kavyas were enjoyed more by being read out 
explained, commented on, and so on than being privately read. Those who read out, those who read out, and those who heard and enjoyed the Kavyas were both accomplished conversions. They must have been bilingual or even multilingual. Both the performer and his audience could relish the language and the imaginative program of the great poets and explanation was probably both Sanskrit and the local language. Did they read the whole text as a single unit? Or did they read individual chapters and that to a random? The structure of the Kavyas with each chapter, even each words has more or less autonomous units, such as the latter possibility, which in any case was the later practice in India. This takes us to another closely related aspect. Two developments take place in the literary history of Sanskrit, along with the rise of the Kavyas, almost simultaneously with it. At one level are commentaries of many collaborations, such as Tippani, Tika, Yakyana, and Vivarana. It all begins with the breaking of the words at the Sandhi joints, Padacheva, identifying the gender, case, conjugations, etc. Then reordering the words in prose order, Anvaya. Anvaya itself followed different styles, such as the Anvaya, Khanda Anvaya, Adanksha, Katham Bhudi, etc. Following this were considerations of Adankara, Chandas, Rasa, and other details of literary appreciation, including the grammatical features of every word and expression, and so on. The commentary will then quote authorities to elucidate the commentator's arguments, the basis of what is said there, etc. In this way, room, often producing new knowledge, commentaries. Such commentaries on the Kavyas, bringing out all nuances in the Kavyas to help in literary appreciation as a byproduct of the Kavyas. It may be remembered here that as many as 32 commentaries of Kiratarjuniya are known, perhaps more waiting to be discovered. Side by side with this, there is the emergence of what is called Alankara Shastra or literary criticism, seeking to theorize literature in various ways. This Shastra graduates into a separate branch of knowledge, calls itself Sahitya Vidya, and claims treatment as a seventh Anga, seven, that is Vedanga, along with Shiksha, Kalpa, Vyakarana, Muripa, Chandas, and Yantisha on account of its utility. Gubhagaratva Alankara Sattamangam or a fifth Vidya, Panchami Sahiti Vidya, on a par with and distinctive from the four traditional ones, such as Anvikshiki, Trayi, Partha, and the Dadiji. Such theorization helped in analysis of the implications of the Kavya, both in total and words by words. This at one level, and the commentaries of varying elaborations and quantities at another level, occurred obviously after the emergence of the Kavyas, but there is more to it than a chronological sequence. The public performance of the Kavyas by professional readers demanded and enabled such elaborate commentaries and rigorous theorization. But commentators such as Vallabha, Malinatha, and theoreticians like Dandin and Bhamaha themselves, such performers, such performances had their pedagogic aspects. Malinatha, it may be remembered, is described as a Mahamaha Upadhyaya. Did this performance aspect and the tradition of elaborate commentaries influence Theatre, one is led to such a surmise by looking at the way in which Chakyars performed Kudiyata 
in Kerala. They perform Sanskrit plays in isolated acts at random, rarely in full. Coming to details, they take up a sloka, the performance of which often goes for hours on end. They first recite it in the appropriate raga to the accompaniment of mudra, then in the anvaya order, and then in mudra alone. The anvaya follows the akanksha type. They start with the finite verb and its subject. For instance, let us take the first verse of Kedaparjaniya itself. <coughs> they would begin. Vanejara samayayau, and then explain it orally and in mudra. Translated, the forester came. What kind of forester? Varnilingi, in the guise of a student, came to whom? Yudhushthiram. Where was he? Dvaitavani, in the Dvaita forest. How did the forest, Vidita, having the other intelligence? so on and so forth. And then each of these is elaborated, sometimes taking several hours. The Kavya with its commentaries, literary theories, and their performance, as well as their pedagogical aspects, went a long way in creating an experience that is unique in literary appreciation. Such an experience, I risk repeating this possible only in a complex society. The lineage-based society represented by the narrative portions of the Mahabharata was ill-equipped for it, nor did it have any use for it. And the complex state society of early medieval India had the wherewithal for it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Keshavan Um We still have um, some 25 to 30 minutes for questions. I have a couple of questions, but let us see if um, some of our listeners in the audience have questions to pose first. Again, um, if you have a question, uh, you have the Q&A um, on uh, yeah, at the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> so while we're waiting for questions from the audience, I'll ask at least one of my two questions now. Um, as well, thank you for the beautiful lecture um, and also for the uh, historian's analysis of the social reality that may have produced a work like the Kirata Junior. If we uh, if we look at the later history of the Kirata Junior, and then we see many later versions in Kerala, at least two or two and a half, so to speak. Um, there is the Prabandham intended for Kutti performance by the Chakyas and described to Narayana Bhatta. Uh, that exists in two forms. There's a short one and a long one. The longer form of it has very extensive quotations from Parvi integrated into the text. The shorter one, much less of that. But the, um, the story that they tell and the version that they offer us is um, is very different from what we read in Bharavi. Um, so I wonder, and then the, also we have, I, I should just say, I'm sure you know, we have a long version of the Kirat Arjuniyam in Mandrangam. Embedded in the Mandrangam, there's a Kirat Arjuniyam segment towards the end of the 40 days performance of uh, Mandrangam, uh, in which the actor on stage narrates the Kirata Ujuniya, again, with certain very characteristic changes that belong to the ambiance of the Kuriata performance. I wonder if you'd say something about that, about the way this text has changed 
and over the centuries and you know and the, in the same vein as your own uh, as your lecture what are the conditions the social and economic and political conditions which made it possible for a change like that in fact i should have i should have loved to include these also in this but then i was worried about the time uh, now we have uh, more uh, such uh, from kerala for example apart from these two versions which chakers use the independent uh, kiravam prabandham of melpattur narayana bhatta and mm-hmm. the one that is included in mandrankam gudiyattam there is this uh, very very interesting kiratham thullal by kunjan nambiyar which mm. is uh, which is a marvelous text and uh, which is performed even today it's a hilarious marvelous text that you have and there is also a vyayoga by kodugallur kunjikuttamburan kiratharjini a vyayoga where mm. the conversation between kirata between kirata and arjuna is very interesting and i have uh, i have thought about uh, writing a piece on the many avatars of uh, kirata arjuni uh, starting from the mahabharata uh, theme down to perhaps the latest is kunjukutam uh, namarans the ayoga in sanskrit uh, the the context perhaps hasn't uh, had any major influence on this at least when you read the when you read the mandrangam version or melpathur's version we don't see the late medieval or early modern stamp in any of these they have read it up closely similarly in the case of uh, in the case of kunjukutam uh, namaran's uh, vyayoga it's only it's only a very interesting detailing of this uh, story with a very very kind of uh, uh, what do i say tit for tat kind of conversation between arjuna and shiva but when we come to kiradam tulla that is kunjanam pyar we can definitely see the early modern uh, making making a very important uh, uh, presence there in kunjanambya for example the context in which travancore had that is vena at that time it was not travancore yet vena mm. and ramarthanda verma had conquered the uh, northern regions and united it into the bigger kingdom of uh, travancore the way in which he bulldozed the local chieftains further north etc is disapprovingly described in this and other other prabandhams mm. of uh, kunjanambya so it is more political than social in fact in this i was uh, the other day reading it again there is this uh, word pork used in uh, the kiratam thullal pork as a, as a european word had already reached malayalam by 18th century when kunjan nambiar was writing this uh, a purist like kunjukutan muran or melpathu wouldn't have used the european word but he had no problem pork is the word that kunjan nambiar uses and the portuguese word porco certainly certainly has influence that views uh, this is not the only thing if you if you go further and further you can see contemporary politics contemporary society making its presence felt in the kiratam thullal of kunjanambe not so much the prabandha of uh, mandapattu or the mandranga version the shorter mandranga version of the same prabandha shorter mandrangam version or even kunjikottu namirats vyayoga which is much later that is only about a century old now hmm. perhaps you'll write that essay that would be a gift to all of us um i may like to uh, add to what professor keshavan was saying 
if you like to in fact kiratam is i think a very favorite one of the favorite themes in malayalam literature not just literature even performances and i'd like to mention the atakatha the source text for kathakali also here which is one of the again one of the favorite ones in the theater on the stage kathakali stage and perhaps for the deviations and how you treat how the, the author has treated and the performance is treated the text also i think is worth considering if you're taking up that brahat volume with which is going to compile all the kirata texts the kirata arjuniya texts and how for example the uh, the katala and katalati is the 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 uh, uh, no, shiva and wife represented as the kirata and the kir the wife it is very it's also there's a lot of typical touch of humor that the poet brings in which is kind of uh, i think elaborated by the actor so many like kunchan nambiar what you were mentioning so i think a lot of scope on that front Keshavan, did you want to respond to that? No, no, I forgot to mention this uh, Atakatha. That is, uh, but yeah. no, I, I have that also in my hit list. <laughs> I think the tone of the Kunja Nambia uh, work is completely different. It's playful and <laughs> sarcastic. It is. It is. Uh, the and, and another thing that I noticed in the, in the case of Kiratarjuni is that uh, Parvati does not make her presence. Uh, Parvati is totally absent in Giravarjini. Yes. In all, the other, in all the other renderings, you have Parvati. A second thing is, a second thing very interesting is that uh, the word Pashuvata is not mentioned in Giravarjini. The whole endeavor of Arjuna is to get Pashuvata. But Giravarjini doesn't you know if you view Give a word yeah. search, you will not find the word uh, Pashuvata at all in Karatardini. I have been I have been very uh, amused by this, intrigued by this, and amused by this. There's another um, interesting variation in the Lepakshi murals. At Lempakshi, you have a complete series of uh, ceiling paintings of the Kirata Arjuniyam. And there they include what appears to be a Kannada, Karnataka piece of the story in which uh, Parvati, she sees during the Malayudham, during this wrestling match between Arjuna and Shiva, she sees her yes. husband yeah, with this mole on his shoulder. And this, right, she sees the mole and identifies him on the ground. And uh, that, I believe, is also there in the earlier Kannada versions. But we have a question from the audience. This is from Dr. Arpan Guha. Um, from uh, Samhita, uh, he asks, what are your thoughts on the Aihole inscription, uh, inscription which is inspired by the Kira Taujuniya? No, one cannot, uh, one cannot quite say that it is entirely inspired by Kira Taujuniya. There are two points here. Aihole inscription, the author of Aihole inscription, Revihirti, described himself as Kavita Ashrita Kalidasa Bharavihirti. That is, mm -hmm. one, who, one who has the fame of both uh, uh, Kalidasa and Bhairavi on the basis of the, the poetic abilities. So this is one thing. Then the other is, uh, speaking about uh, Pulagation and uh, his predecessors, they are, uh, they are described as great warriors. Now, for example, if I remember, Nana, Heti, Chatapikata, no, the, the kind of uh, very, very uh, harsh hearing words to describe the warrior hero character of the hero, that is reminiscent of perhaps the 17th chapter where there is this uh, fight between Shiva and Arjuna. But otherwise, you cannot quite say that this inscription is inspired by Kiravarjuna. In fact, now I can tell you something about my autobiography also. I came and to Kiravarjuna through a Hole inscription. Mm. As, as I was teaching in Delhi University, I was teaching a course on sources. 
to the infill students and in one year we had prescribed the whole inscription and then we had to read it thoroughly with the students so as we were reading this part of it that is describing the religiously describing himself as kavita shrita kalidasa bharavi kirti i asked a question why did he choose these two particular poets why didn't he say that uh, he could he could uh, surpass other poets like for example bhasa or uh, valmiki or uh, uh, vyasa Mm-hmm. after a pause one of the more intelligent students asked i think it is because of the veela rasa that these two have very very strongly brought out in their poems for example rikhumsha and kiratarjiya that bharavi wanted to identify himself with uh, uh, these two Uh, Ravi Kirti wanted to identify himself with these two. Mm-hmm. Then we thought that is possible and uh, we went to Giradhar Tiriya and the very first verse itself, as I explained, uh, told us that uh, students of history must certainly read this. So that is perhaps an unintended influence of Giradhar Tiriya upon this inscription. Otherwise, I haven't seen any direct influence. That's the first mention we have of the Kalidasa's name, isn't that right? Uh, I think, uh, is it in this or is it in the Mandal's or inscription? I'm, in, I'm, getting, I'm getting my dates confused. Is it in I think, the Ayatollah yeah. inscription or is it mm. in the Mandal's or inscription that is some reference to Kalidasa or his work? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm just checking. Let us check it. I think it may be the Ayahole inscription. We'll see. Um, there's, I'm not seeing any other questions yet from the audience. So let me ask you my second question. Uh, sorry, there is a comment, I think, by Professor Kunkum Roy. Ah, I don't see it on my screen, really. Um, please. Don't you, David? No, I don't see it. Oh, then... महाभारत even as they were reworked given that the socio political context was different <laughs> well i can i can only start with the usual way in which uh, we start answering difficult questions that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> thank you say that you don't have an answer but uh, let us uh, let us think uh, loudly i will i will believe that since uh, these two are such a such a rich repertoire for poets uh, mahabharata himself says yadihasti tadanyatra so since it has a rich treasure anybody anybody to, could take from it expand on it elaborate on it perhaps uh, perhaps i may like it and they present it as a good poem bad poem in different poem and this was a rich treasure house they were making use of this treasure house you don't have to depend on your imagination for that uh, at the same time you know, as you see in the case of uh, bhasa for example bhasa had taken the contemporary folklore also which was not recorded in either of these uh, epics but either the either the folklore or what is contained in these epics which were themselves a folklore to to, to be very very sure which were themselves part of the folklore it was these that was elaborated 
in the in the poems starting from mahasa uh, and going on like the mahaka ishvi raksha any any of these thank you this is uh, this is what i have felt i haven't thought about this question when you asked this question i thought uh, i thought about this perhaps it is the richness of the treasure hmm what do you think of the idea that this story in whatever version is popular because of its depiction of this struggle between the human being and god that's an in, you know so <laughs> so intensely interesting theme not only in india you know in the bible there's the story of the patriarch jacob the wrestling with an angel who mm-hmm. is a form of god and gives the name the name israel comes from that that struggle and i'm wondering reminds, this uh, yeah. this comment of viewers uh, reminds me of a particular way in which uh, the kirata arjuna fight is represented by one of the malayalam poets in the 20th century there was this poet nalapat narayana menon balamani mas uncle that is kamala das's uh, mother's uncle Mm-hmm. He was a very, very important poet in the late 19th century, early 20th century. He has a very interesting words, which uh, roughly translates that in order to be eligible to understand the message of uh, Gita, you have to first fight the, the wildness in you. Kaadatthattadu, edirthu thottu. you mm. you first fight the wildness in you even if you lose there it's only after you have fought the wildness that you are eligible to understand the meaning of bhagavad gita so arjuna in order to be eligible to receive bhagavad gita from krishna had to first fight with the fight with a garden a, a hunter a forester Professor Keshwan, I think you could also, in the same context that you were just quoted the verse, refer to Kutti Krishna Maharaj's uh, uh, interpretation of this same story, which you know, which you know very well, you, we have discussed. Is, uh, you know, Maharaj, Maharaj elaborates on uh, Malapad's uh, idea yes. here. Yes, that's why. Right. And elsewhere, and elsewhere, that is Maharaj, Maharaj in his uh, Bharata Variyarna takes mm. up this episode for for one of the chapters there and there but he doesn't go into the kavya part of it he takes up only the I, question in the, in the mahabharata the episode in the mahabharata discusses this and says that arjuna arjuna uh, civilizes himself in this fight with the hunter mm-hmm. so I want to ask you another question which is related to what we've been talking about because have you mentioned the 15th sarga of this of the kirata ujniya and we know this is the chitrabandha section with uh, verses that are palindromic and verses that are shlishta and all kinds of um, literary devices <laughs> and automatics uh, yeah so I wonder I mean I have the thought about it but I'd like to know your thought why why does this come towards the end of the text before the resolution in the battle why what was there some logic to the appearance of this 15th chapter in the, with that kind of a tonality to it I, I don't really know but uh, could it be could it be that uh, we are being told through this that we are reaching the climax of a very very complex kind of a relationship and mm. this notice is given in a very complex way i do not mm. know i think that's probably right i think that because it is moving towards the final moment where you know he has to grab onto his legs and goes up to up, go up towards heaven it's a moment of a kind of preliminary sayujyam and that sayujyam i think is part of the linguistic world of the 15th chapter you know 
when language itself is capable of um, of somehow comprising uh, um, opposed or anyway very diverse registers and there's certainly an intensification of the language since it's moving towards this intense conclusion there's a tremendous intensification I like the chapter not everybody likes those kinds of the chitra bandhas but actually I like them a lot and I think there's a tremendous beauty in it um, mm-hmm. amazing it was, it was really hard to negotiate with it when I was yeah. uh, translating it, it was really hard negotiating with it. Yeah, 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 of course. Actually, they're not really translatable, those verses. They can only be somehow experienced in the original. Um, let's see if there are any more questions from the audience. Um, we'll wait a minute or two. Niharika, there is one more question uh, that is flagged here. Do you think? I mean, or is it? Or is it... I'm not seeing it myself. That is Yeah. I'm not seeing another question. So. Since in, in any case, our time is almost up, I just want to thank you. You know, must thank you. Uh, thank you for the, for the great honor. One more from Malini, Saran. There's one from ah. Malini. Yes. Mm-hmm. Comment. comment. We see this story illustrated in a temple in East Java. That's important, actually. Um, can you tell us, Malini, which of the, I'm going there in a few weeks, East Java. Can you tell me which temple has the Kira Tarajaniya um, reliefs? Uh, uh, it's a temple in East Java. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, now it has slipped my mind because I'm sitting in Europe and my mind is completely in a different place. But I will write to you and tell you because I know, I've seen it. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, very interesting to see the way it is blended into the narratives of other other narratives in that very same temple. It's not solely the, this, this narrative. And I another point, uh, another point I'm, I'd like to make. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Another point I'd like to make is that in the old Javanese Ramayana, which is takes all the, it's, 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 it's as you know, it is, it is uh, uh, based on, well, not based, actually derived from the Bhatti Kavya, and they're using all the Alankaras. But I feel yeah. that there's a very strong influence of Bharavi also. It's never been said before, but from all that you have been saying, I feel that the way the Veera Rasa has been um, explored and the way the rhetoric, example of rhetoric is explored, I have a strong feeling that it is it has got the influence of Bharavi because they are trying very hard to be very close to the Mahakavyas of India at that stage. So just to say that the influence of this great poet and his texts and his techniques have, went far beyond um, um, India, right into East Java. Malini, one question yeah. to you. Could it also be that it is based on some uh, adaptation of a literary text or so that is available in in the in that place in East Java or any other place uh, that they must be basing. Yes, yes that certainly, place. certainly there is a literary text, uh, um, which I'm now forgetting, but it it certainly there is one. I can't tell you exactly. I'll look it up. I'll look up my references and tell you before you leave. When it's you're fine. leaving, you're going to Java, aren't you, Sudha? Yeah, I'm going to. Yes, you too. Um, end yes. of July. I'm going to yes. be in Kediri, also in Malang, which is close to the old ja- yes. East Java. Yes. There's so a, one, of the great Kakawins, one of the great Kakawins in, in, that is in old Japanese is yes. the is a Kirata Algenia. That is, yes. I think it's called the uh, Vijaya. Um, yes. so. Arjun Vivaha. Arjun Vivaha. No, that's not. Yes, true. there's Arjun Vivaha. That is awesome. Arjun yeah, Vivaha. Yeah. Yeah. Arjun Vivaha is a text. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Arjun Vivaha. That's all. That's an East Japanese period. Yeah. So it's uh, very interesting to see all. It's very interesting to see all the ways that this has been used. The, the story, yeah. the, the manner of telling of this great poet and the story from the Mahabharat. 
because the Mahabharata is a very important place in Indonesia, which you will see when you're there along with the Ramayana. But what I find interesting is that in the Ramayana, he has used the techniques and the uh, Alankaras, and I think from many from, from uh, uh, Bhairavi, from the mm. way Bhairavi, Bhairavi is written, his Kirata Junya. Mm. So it's crossed, you know, it's not only the Mahabharata, it's also in the Ramayana. You see the influence of the poetic uh, expressions. Okay, thank you for that. And um, again, uh, Keshav, and um, thank you for thank the you for a wonderful lecture. lecture. It was absolutely yeah. fascinating. Thank you so much. So, Namaskaram to everybody. Thank you. Um, bye.